in the next 20, 25 minutes, we'll, we'll go over the new oral anticoagulants and uh, when, to tr when to give them and how to give them, and we'll go from there. I'm one of the, I'm one of the staffs at the Cleveland Clinic in the Department of Cardiology, Division of Electrophysiology. So let's go ahead and start our presentation. Okay, stroke is common in patients with atrial fibrillation. And actually, it is the risk of stroke in people with atrial fibrillation is, on average, five times the risk of stroke in patients who don't have atrial fibrillation. But the biggest problem in patients with atrial fibrillation and stroke is that stroke leads to death in patients with atrial fibrillation. It is the number one reason why people die from atrial fibrillation. It's not because they have atrial fibrillation, it's because they have a stroke and then the stroke will kill patients with atrial fibrillation. So we have multiple trials that looked at that and see to see can we decrease the risk of stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. And multiple of these trials showed yes, we can decrease that risk. Then we said, okay, let's, instead of giving uh, anticoagulation to everybody, can we identify these folks that are at increased risk of stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation? And some of these, oh, sorry, and some of these risks are as follows. And as all of us know, this CHAD score, C-H-A-D-S. So what does CHAD score mean? CHAD score means congestive heart failure. And it does not have to be systolic heart failure. It can be diastolic heart failure. It has to be symptomatic heart failure. So any heart failure, whether it is systolic or diastolic, is an increased risk of stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. Hypertension. So what is hypertension? We used to think that it is systolic high blood pressure above 160, but right now we adopt the usual definition of high blood pressure, which is above 140 systolic or above 90 diastolic. It's age. As we get older, the risk of stroke goes higher especially once we hit the 65 to 75 years of age. And then diabetes mellitus, whether it is type 1 or type 2 diabetes mellitus, unfortunately, it is a risk for stroke. And the last thing is the risk of stroke or systemic embolization. So it does not have to have a stroke. It could be a TIA or it could be a systemic embolization, meaning a patient who woke up one day and has a black toe or a black finger or he could not see in their eyes or he had a renal infarct or mesenteric infarct. So any source of emboli that we suspect that it's maybe coming from the heart is an increased risk of stroke in these patients. So what we usually do is that we have this CHAD score and we collect, we mark for congestive heart failure, it gets one score. For hypertension, it gets another score. For age, it gets another score. And for the risk of uh, uh, systemic embolization and, and uh, systemic embolization, it gets two. And we add them. If that risk turn out to be more than one, meaning two or above, then we put these patients need, uh, need anticoagulation. However, there are other scenarios that we have to use anticoagulation in patients with atrial fibrillation that are outside the CHAD score. So what are these indications? One of these indications is if a patient has a mechanical valve. Another indi indication if they have mitral stenosis. So anytime an individual who has atrial fibrillation with history of moderate to severe mitral stenosis, they need to be on anticoagulation. Why? Because this combination of AFib and mitral stenosis is very thrombogenic. Patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, even if their CHAD score is zero, they need to be on anticoagulation. Patients who are hyperthyroid, until you get them euthyroid, they need to be on systemic anticoagulation. And the last thing is systemic embolization, they need to be on anticoagulation. There's so many, well, this is the cascade that I've never understood and been able to memorize. However, this is a schematic diagram to tell us where, how would the clot forms from point A to point Z? And any place that we can interrupt this cascade would lead to a less thrombogenic system or uh, it will act as an anticoagulant. We have multiple drugs that can affect this. We, warfarin, for example, can work on factor uh, seven, can work on factor 10, and ultimately can work on factor two. But we have newer medications that could act directly on, an, on the thrombin or indirectly through a, a factor 10A agent. Why, why we had to look 
someplace else besides Kimmerdin. The problem with Kimmerdin is unfortunately it's underused and it is misused. Why is that? Because if we look at patients who are who needs to be on Kimmerdin or needs to be on an anticoagulant, we'll find out that 20% of oh, I'm sorry, 20% of them are supratherapeutic, which is bad because if they are supratherapeutic, they're not necessarily getting the advantage of decreased risk of stroke, but they are actually getting significantly increased risk of intracranial bleeding and other ble systemic bleeding. A big portion of them are subtherapeutic, and usually in most of the studies, the, 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 sub, uh, the incidence of subtherapeutic anticoagulation ranges between 35 to 45 percent of patients, and only around 40 percent of patients will be therapeutic on an, with an INR. So what are the shortcomings of warfarin? One, as we all know, it a, has a very narrow therapeutic window. We always try to aim between two to three or two to three and a half, because higher than three or three and a half, intracerebral bleeding. Lower than two, they don't get much benefit. So the other problem is that they need frequent blood check. The last thing is that we have a lot of inter and inter inter and intra individual dose variability. So it depends on an individual if he eats something or she eats something or they take a certain antibiotic or a certain drug. All of these can interact with Coumadin and either increase uh, the INR or decrease the INR. So what would be a perfect anticoagulant? A perfect anticoagulant is a medicine that we give that we don't have to check, that we know that if we, if we give it to an individual X that it is going to work and I don't have to monitor it. And more importantly, there's not much drug interactions between the medicine that we're introducing and other medications or diet that the individual would like to follow. And more importantly, we want a drug that if we give, we know that it's going to act right away. And if we want to stop, we know that it, its effect is going to go away. Why? Because we don't want to give a drug that we start and then two, three, four days we're going to see its effect. And we don't want a drug that if something bad happened, that if we stop, it's going to take again two or three days for its effect to go away like the Coumadin. So this is the ideal anticoagulant. So, Recently, we've had three medications that are one step closer to being an ideal anticoagulant. And these three medications are the dabigatran, the rivaroxaban, and the apixaban. One of these medications, the dabigatran, works on a thrombin, it's a thrombin inhibitor. The other two are factor 10A inhibitors. Again, they work on that cascade to block anti, uh, to block. Uh, the formation of a thrombus. So let's talk about these three medications and we'll go over one at a time. The first medicine that I'd like to talk about is the Dabicatran and that was studied in the RELY trial. So let's a little look a little bit at the RELY trial. They got patients, around 18,000 patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation and they gave them dabigatran at two doses, one 110 milligram twice a day, and the other one was 150 milligram twice a day, and they said, let's compare them to warfarin. So what did we find? What we found is that patients on the lower dose of dabigatran, which is the 110 milligrams, they did similar to warfarin with respect to the risk of stroke. The patients who got the higher dose of dabigatran, the 150 milligram of dabigatran, they did better than warfarin with respect to the risk of stroke. So it's a little bit superior than warfarin in decreasing the risk of stroke in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. However, what we found out is that the risk of gastrointestinal bleeding and the risk of myocardial infarction is a slightly higher with the higher dose of dabigatran compared to warfarin. And this could be because of two things. This could be because the medicine actually could cause myocardial infarction, which we think is unlikely. The other explanation, it could be because we're not seeing the beneficial effect of warfarin in decreasing the risk of myocardial infarction, which we've seen in multiple prior trials. So what we need to understand from the Dabigatran trial is that the higher dose is more effective 
but there's a slightly increased risk of gastrointestinal bleeding and a slightly increased risk of myocardial infarction. But if we get everything together, meaning the risk of the benefit that we get from intracerebral, decrease the risk of uh, systemic stroke, the decreased risk of intracerebral bleeding, and we get everything together, we put them including the risk of myocardial infarction and GI bleeding, we can still find that the net, there's a net clinical benefit by giving the higher dose of dabigatran over warfarin. So we clearly know that this is most likely a slightly superior drug than warfarin when it comes to the risk of stroke in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. So let's look at what we do here in the United States. What we do, we have, we don't have the 110 milligram. What we have, we have two doses. We have the 75 milligram, which we've never studied, and we have the 150 milligram twice a day. When do I need to use the 75 milligram twice a day? I use it because in patients who have renal dysfunction. So if the creatinine clearance is between 15 and 30, then I use this lower dose of dabigatran. Or if I'm going to use this medicine in conjunction with two of other medications, the dronedarone or systemic ketoconazole. Why? Because of both of these medications can increase intra uh, concentration of dabigatran in the body. So you have to use lower dose if you have mild to moderate form of renal dysfunction and they're taking the systemic dronedarone or systemic ketoconazole, then you have to use the lower dose of dabigatran. So let's go to the other, medi other medication, which is rivaroxaban. Rivaroxaban is not an antithrombin medicine uh, like dabigatran. It's a factor 10A inhibitor. And that was studied in the rocket AF trial. So what did they do with the rocket AF trial? They gave patients rivaroxaban at 20 milligram twice a day, and we compared it to warfarin in a big group of patients, around 14 to 15,000 patients, and we looked at the risk of stroke or systemic embolization. And we saw similar phenomenon that we've seen in the dabigatran is that this drug was none inferior compared to warfarin. But what we found is that the risk of hemorrhagic stroke was better. This again, so similar to dabigatran, the risk of intracerebral bleeding was lower compared to warfarin. The risk of fatal bleeding was also lower compared to warfarin. So, so Again, this is a drug that has similar efficacy to warfarin, but increased risk of intracerebral bleeding as well as fatal bleeding. Similar picture that we've seen in the dabigatran story. But what we didn't see is that we did not see the superiority that we've seen with the dabigatran. In the US, we have two dosages. We have the 15 milligram and we have the 20 milligram. In patients with normal kidney function, we'll use 20 milligram. In patients who have mild to moderate uh, renal dysfunction with creatinine clearance between 15 and 50, we use the lower dose, which is 15 milligram. Lower than that, we cannot give rivaroxaban. There are two special scenarios that we need to be worried about in, in patients who we give them rivaroxaban. The first scenario is that if we're doing spinal sticks, if they're doing spinal anesthesia or we're doing neuroaxial anesthesia where we're going to stick a needle in that space, there we found that there's increased risk of bleeding if in patients who continue to take rivaroxaban. So the recommendation is you have to stop the rivaroxaban around 18 hours before you do this procedure. The other thing that we saw is that there's a slightly increased risk of a stroke when we stop this drug. So in patients, for example, where you want to give them, for example, one of these antibiotic, rifampin or ketoconazole, where you have to change, uh, we have, that may affect the intra, intravascular, I mean, uh, the blood concentration of this drug, and you want to shift them, you have to bridge them to something else in, in, in case they have higher risk of um, CVA during that time. The last drug that we want to discuss is apixaban. The story of this drug is that we studied it in two trials. The first trial was studied in patients who we thought or do their doctors thought, uh, 
the doctors thought that they are at increased risk of bleeding from warfarin, or a group of patients that they're not candidate for warfarin, and they only could be candidates for aspirin. So what we did is that we gave them apixaban versus aspirin. And what we found out is in this group of patients that we thought that they could not tolerate Coumadin, is apixaban is way much better than aspirin. The risk of stroke is way much lower. The risk of bleeding was similar to aspirin. So you have a drug that has much better risk of uh, decreased risk of stroke compared to aspirin, and no increased risk of bleeding compared to aspirin. And then we said, wow, this is a good drug. Let's study it now head to head with warfarin. And this is where the Aristotle trial came. And they compared now warfarin versus this drug. And let's see what we found. We found that the risk of stroke or sorry about that, risk of stroke and systemic embolization was lower than warfarin. We found that the risk of hemorrhagic stroke was much lower than warfarin. We found that the risk of death was lower than warfarin. So again, similar story to the previous two drugs. It is better, a slight, maybe slightly better than the warfarin, lower risk of intracerebral bleeding. Um, so, so what should I do when I face a situation where I have to give an anticoagulant? Should I give warfarin? Should I give this one, apixaban? Should I give uh, uh, rivaroxaban? Or should I give dabigatran? You can give anything you want, but <laughs> you're the doctor. But there are certain, you can, you can use some of the clues that we learned from these trials that you can apply these, these things that we've learned from these trials to your clinical practice. One of the things that we learned from these trials is that all of these drugs decrease the risk of intracerebral bleeding. So in patients who are, we are concerned about intracerebral bleeding, this is maybe a drug that you would want to use. This is where you would want to use the newer oral anticoagulants. So what are the group of patients that are increased risk of intracerebral bleeding? Patients who have labile INRs, one day their INR is two, and the other day is four. You know, when they're four, the risk of bleeding is much higher. The other group of patients is that they have hypertension that we've been having a difficulty to control. You may consider one of these drugs instead of, instead of warfarin. Patients, for example, who have special dietary needs, like vegans, you know, there's a lot of, you, it's hard to know how much vitamin K they're getting every day. Uh, and it fluctuates between a day and a day. So this is where you would consider these drugs. However, let's be a little bit more specific. If, an, if you're concerned about mortality, risk of bleeding because of higher risk of bleeding, you may consider the apixaban because we saw from the Aristotle trial that the risk of bleeding is significantly lower than warfarin and there may be a slight mortality benefit. If you're concerned about efficacy, meaning you want a superior drug that's more powerful than warfarin, you have to think about dabigatran. A scenario like that in patients, for example, with significantly higher risk of stroke, people who have prior risk of stroke, people who have very high CHAD score, you may consider this dabigatran. A patient, uh, when would you consider rivaroxaban? When there's a compliance issue. You, the other two medications you have to take twice a day, except the warfarin. Rivaroxaban, it's a single dose once a day. So patients who are compliant, as well as patients who have prior history of DVT, pulmonary embolism, or acute coronary syndrome, this drug have been shown to decrease all of these as a treatment for, for example, if you have a patient who have had a prior DVT, as well as they have atrial fibrillation, so, you know, an easy decision is to go with rivaroxaban. Not that the other medications cannot be given, uh, I see some of my friends been giving it off-label, but that's an off-label use, so you want to stick to the label use, so that's, that's where a, a scenario you would consider using rivaroxaban. The other place where you have to use warfarin, and when can I use warfarin, or when should I use warfarin, in patients who are pregnant, you know, in the second trimester, or patients who have mechanical valve, or cost is an issue, because still, there's nothing cheaper than warfarin, and if you're concerned about 
the fact that if you're concerned about that you don't have an antidote to the other medications, because none of these other medications we have an antidote, warfarin we do, which is transfusion. So if you're concerned about that, then you would want to use warfarin. So how do I switch from one medicine to another? To switch to new, the new oral anticoagulants, you start them when the INR is less than two, you start the medication immediately. And in the, in the story with the rivaroxaban, you can start it once the INR is less than three. To switch um, from low molecular weight heparin to uh, um, new oral anticoagulants, when it's time for the next dose, we'll give them the new oral anticoagulants. If you're switching it from uh, unfractionated heparin to uh, the new oral anticoagulant, you start it at the same time you stop warfarin. Why? Because these medications, they act within two hours. So this is the beauty about these medications. Uh, what about dosing errors? I'm pretty sure that you are going to be asking you a lot of questions, your patients, about I took an extra pill or I missed a pill or stuff like this. So if they miss the dose, if it's within six hours, you can just tell them, go ahead and take that extra dose. If it is more than six hours, I usually tell them to skip it and try the next dose. Uh, if for the rivaroxaban, because it's a once a day, uh, we apply the 12-hour rule, less than 12-hour rule, go ahead and take it. More than 12-hour, uh, skip it and go for the, for the next dose. If it's a double, they took accidentally the two doses, um, I, you have to tell them to skip the next dose, except for the rivaroxaban, there's no read for skipping the dose, and you continue with the same regimen. Do we have to monitor? All of these medications are excreted in the kidneys. We do have to monitor the kidney function in patients with, uh, who, are, who are on these medications. For patients with a normal uh, kidney function, there's no need for any, uh, any monitoring. For patients with stage three renal, pay, uh, renal dysfunction, yes, you have to monitor it every six months. And in patients with severe renal dysfunction, you have to monitor it every three months. Um, Okay, uh, quickly, the preoperative management for these medications, when to stop them. If they're having a dental procedure, cataract surgery, skin biopsy, small procedure, you may not need to uh, uh, skip any of the dose, but just do it on them, um, uh, when it, do the, that procedure when they're due for that next dose. Um, for um, patients with low risk procedure, you have to stop it for more, between 48 to, uh, 24 to 48 hours to make sure that the medicine is out of the system. Um, so these are the limitations of warfarin. We said we have to monitor it. There's a lot of drug and drug interaction. There's a lot of drug and diet interaction. There's variable dosing that hopefully we could overcome with the newer oral anticoagulants. However, please, these new, new oral anticoagulants, we cannot give them in patients who have mechanical valves. We cannot give them for patients who have mitral stenosis. And we should not be given in patients with renal dis severe renal dysfunction, and they should not be given in patients who are pregnant, simply because we don't have any data. Thank you very much.